KBTC, a viewer-supported community service of Bates Technical College. From KBTC Public Television Studios in Tacoma, Washington. Welcome to the Steve on the Street podcast, a closer look behind the headlines as public policy and current affairs impact the real lives of real people. Hello and welcome to the Steve on the Street podcast, produced by KBTC Public Television's weekly public affairs program, Northwest Now. I'm your host, reporter and photojournalist Steve Kiggins. Today's episode covers a sensitive topic, so be warned. This episode is not for easy listening. If you aren't ready, if you aren't in the right headspace to hear discussions about self-harm and suicide, today's podcast might not be for you at this time. And I understand, it's a tough discussion. I myself, personally impacted by suicide. It's a triggering discussion. It's wrought with frustration, grief, and worse. America finds itself in the midst of a suicide crisis. The nation recently hit a record number in 2022, losing 50,000 people who took their own life. The year before, 1.7 million people attempted suicide in 2021. That's up 36% from just the year 2000. Our most at risk population are elderly men. And suicide is the number two cause of death for those between ages 10 and 24 right here in Washington state. If you're a veteran, Statistics reveal those men and women have a 53% greater chance of suicide than non-veterans. American Indians and Alaska Natives are also at high risk, higher than any other ethnic or racial group. There are so many factors that come into play for this crisis, ranging from loneliness, substance abuse, mental illness, and on and on. All of these data points are why the National Suicide Hotline was revamped and reintroduced as the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline in the summer of 2022. Phone calls, texts, and chat messages coming into the crisis line surged in the first year of the 988 program. But no matter where and when you call, the person who answers, they have the same goal, to listen, to comfort, to offer support and services aimed at positive outcomes. In Pierce County, South Sound 911 moved into their new facility back in 2021 and soon kicked off the pilot program that brings in crisis counselors from the 988 line into the fold. It's an attempt to triage callers' needs when they ring in and find options to help those struggling with both immediate life and death crises to mental health emergencies and more. So take a listen to our recent Northwest Now coverage of South Sound's 911's recap of their pilot program and what 988 aims to offer those seeking healing and hope. South Sound 911 opened its state-of-the-art facility back in 2021. They were finally able to bring together their 911 dispatchers and call takers all under the same roof. Well, last summer, a pilot program also brought together 988 crisis counselors all together in the mix, and it's a program meant to deliver emergency mental health care. 911, buddy reporting. Completing the new South Sound 911 facility on Pacific Avenue took vision and a decade of planning. Now with a new building and leadership, there's another evolution happening at the agency responding to mental health crises. Can it be that calm voice to help someone while help is on the way? Diana Kaber has been with South Sound 911 for 14 years and says as dispatch technology has changed, so too have expectations from the communities they serve. A new pilot program adds crisis counselors from the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline to the call center. The vast majority are saying, you know, no, I feel like I'm actually connecting them to the right resource as quickly as possible. I'm not giving them a number to call. I'm not, it's a no wrong door type mentality. Sometimes people call and they don't want 
you to fix. They don't need your advice. Rachel Wilson is a crisis counselor with Volunteers of America Western Washington. She says the pilot program allows collaboration aimed at providing the right services for the right crisis. It's really great to be able to, not only do I know about the service, but I know, you know, so-and-so is three chairs down from me. And if I need to pick their brain, I can walk over there yeah. and say, hey, like, we need X, Y, or Z, and we can work together to make sure that the person who called 911 is getting every component of what they need. 988 provides that safety net. The State Department of Health says calls in the 988 Lifeline Centers increased 40% the first year and noted a 124% increase of chat messages and 640% increased of text messages by late 2023 as more people became aware of the service. Besides crisis counselors, a call to 988 in certain cases can dispatch mobile response teams who may offer next day appointments with mental health professionals or inpatient treatment. The 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is free, confidential, and provides critical support for those in need. They want to help people, they care about the people who are calling. I, I just really would urge anyone to call, even if they're in doubt. In Tacoma, Steve Kiggins, Northwest Now. That important work is repeating across every county in our state. Trained volunteers and professionals standing by to take your call, offering peace and solutions for everyone in crisis. Now, next on the podcast, we're sharing an extended interview with Diana Kaber, Communications Center Manager at South Sound 911. She's worked for the organization for more than a decade. Take a listen as she shares with us why she does what she does. She explains her dedication to making a difference and serving her neighbors in the South Sound. You mentioned that you've done kind of every, I think you said you've done almost, maybe I don't want to put words in your mouth. Have you done kind of almost every role every, in this? I would say every role um, prior to our consolidation. So I've never dispatched fire and I have not worked our data channel, but I have taken calls, dispatched law enforcement and supervised the floor. Yeah. Was this like your first job? No. What drew you to this? Uh, I think I was just interested in helping and I felt like I was helping the community in my job prior to here, but I wanted something that maybe was a little different. I kind of wanted that adrenaline, but I didn't have a want or desire to go into a firefighting or being a police officer. So it kind of felt like something I could do and I was interested in and growing up, my sister and I used to watch a 911 show on TV, and that was my reference point. So, luckily, I was able to sit in and do some observation to see what it actually was, you know, versus what you see on TV. And I just was drawn to it, and now I can't imagine doing anything else. That was like Rescue 911 or something, wasn't it? Yeah, I was trying to think of what it was called. <laughs> exactly what it was. Yeah. I can see the open in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> the person on the phone saved their life, but. That's how I felt as a kid anyway, so. You probably don't feel much different now. I think our employees do a really great job helping people every day, yeah. I oversee the operations of our 911 center. That sounds like a lot to do. It's a lot, but it's fun. What does that entail? Um, well, there's three managers and two directors, so together we've split up different roles. My focus area is the operations of call taking and law dispatching as well as policy and procedures, and then the 988 co-location program. When I look out over this window, I see a number of pods. Um, it looks like NASA. It's pretty cool. Uh, there's probably a lot going on I don't even understand. How about viewers understand about what I'm looking at out that window? What are all the agencies, how many people are you like servicing, how many agencies are involved? So we service 38 agencies between our law and fire partner agencies and our service area is everyone in Pierce County. 
and then we work in partnership with uh, Washington State Patrol and the Puyallup Tribe. Prior to the move here, we were in multiple buildings, so we had consolidated our law enforcement call taking and dispatching, and then fire and then our admin and records were in separate buildings prior to moving in here. And since moving in here, our call takers changed from handling law enforcement only calls and transferring uh, to our fire employees uh, to handling both law and fire, which takes away the transfer time. And then um, part of our records division became part of communications too, which you see down there on the floor. And they're the data channel that law enforcement officers switch to for additional information. I would describe what South Sound 911 is as the connection to response. So the first response in an emergency situation, we're helping people find the connection that they need, even if 911 maybe isn't the, the right response. Um, and then for me, it's just trying to support the people who are now doing the job. I like the fact that I've come up through the ranks. I learned call taking and then dispatching and supervising before becoming a manager. So remembering what that's like and how tough that job is. Um, but it's, it's a hard job, but everyone who's down there doing it, they do it because they love the work and they love what they're doing. That's probably a job that you really want to be at. I would say that it's not really one that people continue to do if it's not a good fit for them because it is hard and you have to be able to come back and give a hundred percent each day because people are counting on you just leads me right into my next question yeah what, what is that call what is that draw that desire to keep doing this I think it's just something inside me or inside people who are here to give back to the community and maybe they don't want to be the in-person first response. Maybe they're drawn here for other reasons, but whatever it is, they showed up here and they fell in love with it. And they like the responsibility that comes with it of we show up every day and we try to help connect people to whatever resource can help them most in that moment of need. Do you have to want to help people? Yeah. I mean, every call is all about helping someone. Yep. Someone you don't, may not ever see, may not ever meet, but you're literally a lifeline. Yeah. That's significant. Do you feel like a hero? No. I think that our employees are, yes. Talk to me about that. I just think that kind of the weight on their shoulders to be feel prepared and confident and kind of be that calm voice to help someone while help is on the way is so important and the tools that they need to use to draw out the information needed to get help there is also important um, and then moving from one you know they get off the call with one call and it's right into another call which could be a bigger emergency a bigger crisis or it could be more of a routine call and making sure that you treat each of those people the same way so that they're comfortable calling us the next time they need us, which hopefully they might never have to call us again and it's just their one impression of us. Mm -hmm. But if not, we want them to know we're here and we care and we want to help them. What do you think about this place, <laughs> this facility? This facility is amazing. It, we really are blessed to be here because coming from smaller buildings and older technology and different safety features than what we have now. Um, a lot of the employees who moved in here from other places can value it, but we also look at the fact that we've added almost 100 employees since we've moved in here. So to them, this is normal. You know, this is what a 911 center is. And so um, it's great when we exercise our backup facility and it gives opportunity for people to see an older building that we came from uh, and just how different different centers are. Um, but I think it definitely is feeling normal to a lot of people who work here. Looking back over the last 14 years, a lot has changed and how do we keep changing so that you're meeting the need? Because we don't set the expectation necessarily, our jobs to meet that expectation and keep evolving.
So, part of CABER's role in South Sound 911 deals with standing up the pilot program that places 988 crisis counselors into the emergency response apparatus in Pierce County. And here, what she says are the program's next step in the coming future. The needs and the expectations that, yeah, I think that a lot of the things maybe have always been, but how do, what's the response? How do you help? How do you um, provide help or respond in different situations? That evolves over time. Perhaps it's not uh, absolutely necessary that, that, that 988 taker, call takers um, operate uh, in the same facility, but, but here you've got a component of that. So wh what's the reason to like put those two together? I don't think that it, a lot of places don't have the capability to do it, and I recognize that. I think the fact that we do, and we made the decision and partnered with 988 um, with the goal to provide the best response to the citizens' need as quickly as possible is something that I'm excited that we are able to do. And a warm handoff and a warm transfer, while that's still better than not providing the right resource or not connecting someone to 988, uh, having them here in the building, you're able to identify the 911 caller's needs and connect them with a mental health professional or crisis counselor um, when it's appropriate so that they get that help in the moment without a warm transfer. It's obvious to the callers that it's a different scenario. It's let me get my partner on the line, let me get you know this person on the line. It's working in tandem if it is a call that still needs a police or fire response in the moment. They also provide de-escalation to the situation to help the caller in their crisis while additional resources are getting there, uh, which supports our 911 call takers and the agencies that are responding to them because they really are providing those services in the moment while everyone's sitting together in a room and providing updates to the officers or firefighters who are responding and then the situations where the diversion program really highlights is getting them connected with the crisis counselor who's embedded on the comm floor with our call taker for someone who called 911 but they're looking for help, they're looking for hope and they're able to provide that service to them where maybe they called 911 because that's the number that they've known since they were knee high because they needed help. And we're not looking to turn them away and say who you really wanted is this. Or the other option, which is what we've traditionally done before our project, is we enter a call and law enforcement responds or the fire department responds um, to help them. And really maybe what they wanted was to talk to someone who can help them and help them through their crisis. Their crisis is defined by them. And so each person's crisis, we don't want them to have to try to decipher who do I call when. And while if I know I'm reaching out to 988 and we want to help partner and really showcase that three digit number as well, if they called 911, we want them to still get the same service and the same opportunity as if they the phone and called 988. And I think that's what the co-location really highlights just that ability to connect these people who call 911 because that's what they knew to call you know no I feel like I'm actually connecting them to the right resource as quickly as possible I'm not giving them a number to call I'm not it's a no wrong door type mentality of you called us so how can we connect you in your time of need how can we get you services in your time of need and that same mentality has always existed but we have another resource now to connect to the person with and get them that help and everyone's working alongside each other and talking um, volunteers of america is 
uh, educated us and taught us more too about working with callers with, who have suicidal ideations or thoughts of suicide, a family member who's in crisis. And it's also giving us more tools in our toolbox for helping callers maybe when they're not available or they're already on the phone with someone else as the program still continues to grow. As the program grows, what is next for the program, do you think? Well, our immediate next step is working toward 24-7 coverage, uh, which is very exciting, and I think it's going to help us reach a more population than we already have. We started with some peak hours that we had identified with Rachel, who was our first crisis counselor um, at the launch of the program. And we know that she's needed. We've seen it. We have seen the data, we've seen the benefit, we've heard from our call takers, we've heard from our partner agencies uh, that they feel that benefit, but that's one person and 40 hours a week. And so having it around the clock and seeing what kind of help we can provide, especially those overnight hours where some of our callers, they already, they're in a process or they have help, they have a counselor or a support network but who do they have at three o'clock in the morning and how do they get connected to them? And so I am excited to see as we grow to 24 seven coverage, just how, how many people who have called 911 previously or similar situations that called 911 previously. And again, they received a police or fire agency response. They now are connected to a crisis counselor in the moment right after someone answered the phone and it's someone who's trained to help them for their situation. Did you ever think you'd be talking about this concept like 14 years after you started Dispatch? I don't think I could have dreamed up the, the need or the program, but now I can't imagine us not having something like this just in you know, less than a year that we've been operating and running this program. It's so beneficial. It's beneficial to our employees here at South Sound 911. It's beneficial to the citizens and our partner agencies. It just, now it just seems normal. Like, how did we not have it before? Right? How did we not have these resources as readily available before? How did our society operate without taking mental health care as seriously as it clearly should be? Obviously, hindsight is real, and that we are dealing with the mental health struggles we are now is so easily visible and evident. It just makes me wonder why our focus on the crisis never enjoyed the kind of heightened attention before as we see it does now. The good news, however, if you're in crisis, if you're struggling with suicide ideation or feelings of despair, maybe you just need someone to talk to. The 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is ready and available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to connect you with resources, connect you with a human being on the other end of the line, ready to bear witness to your struggles and help where and how we are ready to receive that help. So thanks again to Diana Kaber for sharing your perspective and experience on the podcast. Thanks also to volunteers of America Western Washington's Courtney Cowell and Rachel Wilson for your participation in our coverage. Also, thanks to the team at South Sound 911. They've really bent over backwards to help connect me with those professionals to cover this sensitive topic. Plus, they got to show off their shiny new state-of-the-art facility in Tacoma. It's more than just a building, though. It's an investment in the region's first responders and our neighbors and its commitment to public safety and mental health. And finally, thanks to you for taking time and interest for joining me on this podcast. I appreciate your continued support. It's always nice to have you here joining us. I'm Northwest Now's reporter and photojournalist Steve Kiggins. We'll see you soon in the next episode of the Steve on the Street podcast. Cheers. Cheers.